Hi, everybody. Welcome to my session on sustainable single family home design and construction. My name is Dr. Matthew Trasoni. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to take you through how I designed and built a resilient and sustainable home here in Miami, Florida. I'd like to start by thanking the resilience team, uh, the symposium team, School of Architecture and the University of Miami for all they did to put together this very important uh, symposium on this topic. So uh, moving forward, let's just take a look at uh, the agenda quickly. Um, I'm gonna cover all these things, although very briefly, um, hopefully I get into, be able, have time to get into depth on the ones that are important, um, then especially the implementation side. Uh, and uh, you know, for that purpose, we need to talk a little bit first about the design methodology. Uh, the methodology is very important because uh, the methodology that you take through the design ultimately gives you the product that you have in the end. Uh, so there's two really key methodologies that I used on this project. One was evidence-based design. So, I, so we were constantly uh, gathering evidence using uh, analysis uh, that comes out of a tool called building information modeling uh, and taking that information that we would get, uh, the feedback about like window openings and other things back to the design uh, and uh, changing things in the actual design so the building would perform better. We also used integrated project delivery. Um, that is bringing all the stakeholders and including subcontractors, uh, owner, which I was, and the architect, uh, developer, getting them all on the same page right away uh, to make decisions up front. And how, what that does is it really speeds along the decision process. It pulls a lot of those uh, time consuming changes and things up earlier in the design process where not only it improves the end product of the, of the design, but it also reduces uh, the cost of any changes that you have. So obviously, if you wait till construction uh, or you're in construction, it's gonna cost a lot more to change something than if you catch that or if you implement that change earlier in the design process. And so that's really what uh, integrated project delivery um, does. And so if we're looking at the reasons why we decided to take on this project and why we wanted to create a highly sustainable, uh, resilient home, um, I think you guys are probably seeing all these in the other sessions in the symposium, but you know, the rise in temperatures since 1850, the projected rise in temperatures going forward, sea level rise, the observed five year on the uh, lower left hand corner, and then the projections of uh, sea level rise going forward that will really impact uh, South Florida, especially the low lying coastal areas, uh, increase in precipitation, um, uh, you know, as recorded. Uh, also, you know, it impacts Miami more because Miami is closer to the equator, which means that we'll have a larger uh, increase in precipitation uh, compared to maybe more northern uh, counterparts in the United States. And also the hurricane power uh, index. Uh, this is just a trend line of a uh, combination of the intensity, frequency, and duration of hurricanes. Uh, and what they've been doing really since 1980 in the North Atlantic Ocean. And you can, you know, you can see the trend here. And so um, this really begs the question for all of us, how should our built environment react to these trends? Um, and I would argue that really we need to take a two-track approach revolving around our two kind of themes. The first one is short-term thinking, really. Uh, and it's resilience, right? And so what resilience really is, is the ability to recover or adjust easily from misfortune or change. And it does reflect the short-term thinking, um, but our buildings really need to be built resilient to withstand the short-term shocks, intense hurricanes, uh, like this image that is shown here from Hurricane Michael uh, in the city of Mexico Beach or village of Mexico Beach, uh, where basically the whole town was devastated uh, by Hurricane Michael. Uh, and I think this building that was designed to withstand these types of hurricanes, all concrete shell, uh, metal roof, um, you know, raised up as it needs to be, the finished floor raised up as it needs to be, survived the hurricane. And I think it's a great lesson on the design of buildings uh, for resilience. However, that's not the whole picture. Our buildings and our infrastructure also need to be designed for the long-term implications to reduce the long-term implications and really that's the sustainability side of the equation uh, because sustainability is meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So we really need to design uh, highly sustainable buildings and infrastructure also. So it doesn't take away from future generations be able, uh, being able to provide 
for themselves. And of course, within sustainability, there's multiple different areas. You know, a lot of people talk about the triple bottom line, economic, environmental, uh, and social sustainability. So when I cover these topics today, uh, I'm really just going to be talking about discovery and design. Uh, but when we look at implementing uh, sustainability and resilient measures into buildings and infrastructure, we really should look at the design, the engineering and permitting, and the construction operation. I'm going to tie in a little bit of the operation at the end because I because I think that it's important. But primarily, I'm going to be dealing with discovery and design uh, today. So when we look at our finished floor elevation, which is really you know the, the reaction or the changing of the height of the floor, you know based on sea level rise, and it could change over time. The kind of key information that we need to collect is the crown of the road, the site elevations and the sidewalk elevations, because our buildings are going to relate to those three things uh, intimately and have to react to those, those three things. Now, after that, we really need to look into what the flood zone is. Okay, so you can have VE, AH, AE, AD, or X. Now, X is the best one out of the bunch, but just because you're in a flood zone X doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, free from dealing with sea level rise because there might be localized flooding or, or, or downpours. So you still need to be above, you know, significantly above your grade, uh, probably at least two feet above your, your existing grade around, your existing sidewalk elevation. Now, if you are in one of those lower lying uh, flood zones, VE, AH, or AE, you need to look at your base flood elevation uh, and you need to be at least a foot above your base flood elevation. Okay, sometimes that could put you at, you know, five, six, seven feet above your existing grade or sidewalk elevation on the current site if you're in one of those flood zones. Um, you also need to look at your 100 year, three day storm uh, stage. Uh, you need to be eight inches above the crown of the road or four inches for commercial. Uh, and then you also want to have your garage at least six or eight inches above the sidewalk elevation. And then you need to worry about how you transition up to the house uh, or up to the building if you have steps or a ramp or other ways to get up that uh, fairly significant height uh, difference sometimes between uh, the sidewalk and, and the building itself. The next aspect uh, that is really, well, it's both sustainable and resilient, but really the resilient I think kind of controls this one, and that's because uh, it really needs to withstand those those short duration or the or the hurricane events that that can happen. Um, and so, for that reason, we and the local uh, nature of concrete materials in South Florida, uh, you know, we did an all concrete and CMU shell. Uh, <clears throat> some of the added benefits of this is it gives what we call rigid diaphragm and structural engineering, but it just basically means that the floor plates are rigid and that you get a very good and strong resistance to hurricane force winds. It also allows you to have parapets, uh, which protect solar panels. We'll take an image, we'll take a look at that image later. Um, it allows you to put overhangs over windows and things where you would like them in order to shade windows uh, and glass openings um, uh, from solar exposure. And we'll also take a look at a little bit of look at that later. Um, and so moving on to uh, the Water, the water issues with buildings. Uh, water reduction is always a key. Um, many different ways to reduce the use of water. One key way is to reduce uh, the need for water in landscaping is probably the lowest hanging fruit. And there's a couple different manuals that we go to and take a look at for that. One of them is the low maintenance landscape for plants for South Florida. That's out of the University of Florida. Uh, and then there's uh, the Miami-Dade Landscape Manual, which is um, uh, contains all types of uh, local species and drought tolerant species and things that uh, you should consider planting uh, in your home. So uh, <clears throat> now onto the, the fixtures in the house. Miami-Dade County did a great thing by implementing uh, these water uh, savings uh, measures uh, in the county. Um, and so we implemented these. You can see that just by implementing, you know, these limits on faucet or on, on plumbing fixtures in general, you get a 31% savings. Um, uh, you get a 31% savings on typical home water usage. So then uh, when we're talking about uh, looking at water harvesting, okay, you can create different levels of water efficiency in your house and water harvesting in your house. One of them is you can do a gray water system, which is harvesting water from like sinks and, and the washing machine or a black, even a black water system, which would mean harvesting even toilet water or water closet water. And you could create a net zero water system 
Um, in our analysis, that wasn't cost effective for a residential home. Um, I know in other applications, it, it could be cost effective, but for our case, it wasn't. So we decided not to do that. We decided just to harvest water uh, in order to offset the landscaping requirements uh, for water. And so um, in order to do that, we have to, we can figure out what our potential water harvesting is. And that's basically the average rainfall in Miami, Florida times your roof area, because you're going to collect it off your roof. And so we took that 62 inches uh, average of annual rainfall in Miami and took and it multiplied it by the square footage of the roof uh, to get how many gallons and some conversions. We got about 54,000 gallons we could harvest off our roof in a year. And then we started to look at the demand side of the equation. Um, and for that, we just took the average US home use uh, and took the 31% reduction uh, from the Miami Dade requirement. And we ended up about 76,000 gallons. And that's if we wanted to replace, you know, all of the dishwashing and clothes washing and stuff in the house, which we didn't. Um, so basically, we just went with uh, having cisterns in order to offset the landscape usage. And then in order to implement that in the design, we sloped the majority of the roofs uh, in one direction uh, and then created a gutter system with downspouts and ran those right into the uh, ran those right into cisterns with some filters to knock out all the big, uh, big debris. Uh, and we use the cisterns regularly, uh, especially in the summer months when it's rainy. We do run dry a few times uh, in the winter months uh, when we look to use those. So maybe bigger cisterns would be uh, a recommendation for future. So another aspect is the envelope and insulation, the envelope of the house. Uh, and so for this, we did a lot of solar study and energy modeling. Um, the solar study helped us uh, get the shades and shadows uh, and the areas of the house that are going to be exposed to high solar heat gains. Um, and so we, this is how we place the eyebrows uh, all around the house and the overhangs and coverings of doors and things. You can see here on the front uh, in the built form, um, you know, those overhangs for the most part block all of the solar exposure in, into the windows and doors and any of the glazing areas. We also did a cavity wall system on the south facade uh, with <clears throat> coral stone um, and we carried an air gap between this coral stone and the actual wall behind it, which is the enclosure wall. And what that does is it creates that thermal break uh, so that sun that beats on that wall all day long that energy doesn't automatically just transfer right into the house. It has that air gap there that helps that heat uh, dissipate. And so there you can see the shading, uh, shading devices on the south facade. And so then we needed to design the level of insulation in the house. And for that, we went to energy.gov to take a look at their recommendations. And we ended up going with a spray on closed cell foam insulation about four inches of it. It gave us between an R30 and an R35 on the roof. And it also gave us an extra layer of waterproofing because it is a watertight uh, seal. Um, and then we just went with the typical uh, foil insulation on the walls outside of the, the cavity wall that we did on the south facade. And so then we wanted to do some benchmarking for energy reduction. So benchmarking just means that we're going out and we're gonna find uh, some standards out there that we're gonna try to meet. Uh, in order to reduce the amount of energy that the house uses. Uh, this is even before we take a look at any production that we're gonna have. And so what we did is we looked at the ASHRAE standard, ASHRAE 90.1 standard. <clears throat> we looked at what average single family homes were doing. Uh, and <clears throat> we looked at the architecture 2030 target, which is a pretty reliable uh, target for where we want buildings to be performing by 2030. Um, and so there, that's what we looked at. And then we went back and we looked at our energy usage of our old house, uh, which was a house that was built in 1942, but renovated in 2008, was, that was updated uh, in 2008. And so we thought it performed probably like a 2008 house. And it turns out that the energy use intensity, that's how we measure, um, <clears throat> that's how we measure the energy usage of buildings is uh, right in average with um, what an average house does built in that time period. Um, but we wanted to reduce that. We wanted to get to the level of what's called a high performance building. And in order to get to the level of performance of a high performance building, we, uh, we would have to get underneath about 78 kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And so in order to do that, we did our energy modeling and our building information modeling in order to, and with this, we can change a lot of things, uh, sizes of openings, 
um, insulation values um, in order to model what the actual energy use is going to be. And so we came up with getting a design goal of 65 uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared per year. And some of those uh, design changes that we did was to put private, private spaces on the west and south with small windows, to put the public spaces on the north and east with the large glazing areas. Um, we also did that on the second floor of the house that some of the functional or design choices that we made. Um, we also had a double height space that have windows on the top to create a stack event ventilation so we can shut off the mechanical equipment uh, certain times during the winter. We placed the mechanical, all the equipment, all the exterior equipment up on the roof. Um, and you can see those glazing areas again, and then that double height space for the stack effect. And we actually have motors on these windows up top that they open and close and let the hot air out uh, when the temperature outside is, is amenable. We implemented the use of a heat pump water heater, high efficiency mechanical systems, uh, we put low, you know, low E glazing on the glass, uh, which improves the insulation values of the glass. All of that for energy reduction. And then for energy production, we went to the National Renewable Energy Laboratory's website. We got our, you know, our potential solar exposure. Um, and they do that in what they call peak hours, peak sun hours. Um, and with that, we can calculate what the potential of our building was. And that would be the number of panels that we can fit times the wattage of the panel times the amount of solar hours in a complete year. And then for the other side of creating a net zero energy building, you got to figure out what the demand is. And so we took our design goal and we the energy use intensity right. for our design goal, we multiplied it by the square footage, square meters of our house, and that got our total demand, what our demand was going to be. And we set the demand equal to the potential and calculated the number of panels that we would need in order to create a net zero house. And we needed th about 36 panels. And so then we went and laid those 36 panels uh, out on the roof uh, with the solar subcontractor. Uh, <clears throat> and they're installed, here they are installed. A couple other, the aggregated benefits that you get from the solar panels. Uh, they also shade the roof so that solar exposure, that solar energy isn't going in through the roof of your house. It's being absorbed by the solar panels. And you can also see here the parapets that are designed around uh, in order to protect the, the solar panels and the roof itself. So then we wanted to look at the operation, the energy operation, uh, and, and you know that was key. So the total from FPL and our solar ended up being about 21, 6,000 kilowatt hours per year. Our design was 19,500. So we didn't quite hit our design, but we still, um, we still, got uh, our high performance building, even without uh, incorporating the energy production. And then if we incorporated our energy production, we got down to 22.7, which it beats significantly the architecture 2030 benchmark, although it doesn't meet our net zero goal that we had uh, for the house. And there could be a lot of reasons for that. One of them we think was maybe COVID because we were in the house uh, with our kids. And you know, so maybe if we were using the energy use intensity factors for schools, that might've been a little closer to uh, how we were actually using the house over the course of the year that we have been monitoring it. And you know, there's other things that we can do to reduce our energy usage you know, in program programmable thermostats, you know, just increasing the temperature in style inside and lifestyle change. You know, I think that's a big one. I think a lot of people are talking about that and, you know, maybe the hardest one, because I do have to say that we really didn't change our lifestyle very much. Uh, and we still got to these types of numbers. So I'm sure we could get to net zero energy or even positive energy with some small lifestyle changes. So there's some future projects coming up. Um, I'll leave those for later and just like to end with saying, when does the price come due? Uh, hopefully, um, we choose to invest in our buildings and our infrastructure and reap the benefits of the re the benefits of of that investment. And so I'd like to thank all of you for joining me here today for my short talk. I hope you guys learned something and got a little inspired to uh, lead by doing, right? Because that's really what we should be. And so now I'll take any questions. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ali Kahramani Nejad. I am an associate professor in the Department of Civil architectural and environmental engineering at UM. Today, I'll be talking about nature-inspired, genetically engineered self-healing for sustainable coastal infrastructure materials. This work 
has been primarily done by my PhD student, Elvis Bar Concrete is the most widely used material in the coastal infrastructure. Concrete is inherently brittle and prone to cracking. So improving the fracture resistance and ductility of concrete can result in significant improvements in sustainability and lowering maintenance costs. The current state of infrastructure in US was given a grade of D+. This emphasizes the sense of urgency to address deficiencies in our coastal infrastructure. Nature provides a profound source of inspiration for engineering. There are several biological materials that show mechanical performance far exceeding those of the traditional man-made engineering materials. Some examples of these high-performance biological materials are the abalone of uh, shell, sea origin, and bone. In this case, which is a nacre of abalone shell, the material is made up of 95% aragonite, which is very weak and extremely brittle. On the other hand, this material has only 5% biomolecules that provide a mechanism for the biocomposite to show fracture resistance that is far more than some of the metallic materials we have. It is these biomolecules that direct the macrostructure formation in these materials and give them such high performance characteristic. Here is the structure of biomolecules. Amino acids are the building blocks of biomolecules. When some of the amino acids are attached together, they form peptides and peptides uh, bond together to form proteins. It is the variety of amino acids with different functionalities and their sequences in the proteins that provide multiple pathway for interaction with concrete. And what that means is that proteins are able to have different ways of influencing the property of concrete. So the idea here is just like a human body is able to heal fractures, can we design a concrete that can self heal when it cracks? Here in this image, you see a crack in a concrete. And to the right, you see the same crack that has been healed. This is a recent result from my lab where we were able to successfully produce a self-feeding concrete. Another material we are studying is hydrogels. Hydrogels are stimuli responsive, meaning they adapt to their surrounding environment. This characteristic of hydrogels has enabled them to find widespread applications in drug delivery, tissue engineering, biochemical sensing, and in smart infrastructure materials. The selfing idea we are pursuing here is based on biomineralization principle. In biomineralization, certain microorganisms such as bacteria facilitate the precipitation of calcium carbonate in crack. As you can see here, we are using hydrogel to protect microorganisms from the high pH and high alkalinity of concrete. Just like we use hydrogel for drug delivery in medicine, we use hydrogel to protect bacteria and provide a mechanism to deliver bacteria 
when they are needed in concrete. The combined biomolecules with biomineralization to achieve high performance cell healing. Here you see some of the bio, uh, biomolecules uh, that we have been working on, lysozyme, albumin, and hemoglobin, and you see the molecular structure of them here. So the first thing we did, we looked at how the characteristics of biomolecules change with pH and alkalinity. What we found was that biomolecules show a higher charge as the pH increases. We also looked at the change in size and conformation of proteins as a function of pH. And what we observed was that proteins undergo significant structural changes as the pH increases. We also looked at the affinity between these proteins and concrete because this affinity is important for the proteins to be able to exert their influence on concrete. And what we observed was that <clears throat> certain proteins have great affinity to concrete as, as shown here. We also looked at the protein calcium carbonate adsorption and protein calcium ion complexation, two processes important in the seal filling of concrete. We also looked at how the chemical structure of concrete modified with proteins uh, look like. Now, this slide is, I would say, um, the more um, important slide than the other slide I have been talking about. Uh, here, we are showing that proteins are able to increase the strength of self-healed concrete. As you can see here, all samples that were modified with concrete showed a higher tensile strength than the sample without modification with proteins. We also looked at the water permeability of samples modified with proteins and what we found was that proteins are able to reduce water permeability of concrete. Water permeability is an important characteristic of concrete. More importantly, the durability aspect of concrete. We also looked at the phase composition of the healing material in concrete. And what we found was that calcium carbonate is the main healing material in concrete. We also use scanning electron microscopy to obtain a fundamental understanding of how these biomolecules increase the self-healing capability of concrete. So with that, I'm going to conclude. So uh, the major findings of this project are as follows. Proteins are able to interact with concrete and this allows them to be able to exert influence on concrete properties. Biomineralization property of concrete was enhanced by the use of biomolecules. The hydrophobic character of biomolecules lowered the water permeability of concrete. In the end, there is a large opportunity for biomolecules to be used in coastal infrastructure materials to induce 
certain functionalities that is not possible using the traditional concrete. With that, I'm going to conclude and thank you for your attention. I'd like to start thanking the symposium organizers, hosts, and sponsors for the invitation to present tomorrow's resilient coastal infrastructure built today. The experts behind this contribution include Tony Nanny, Steve Nolan, the Florida Department of Transportation, and myself, Francisco de Caso. Steve and I will be presenting today. Here's an outline on how the presentation will be divided. Now let's get started by setting the context. The Caribbean, South Florida, and the Gulf of Mexico continue to be exposed to an increased magnitude and frequency of natural disasters. The use of resilient construction materials has demonstrated to increase the ability of a structure to withstand adverse weather and changing climate conditions. However, corrosion of steel reinforcement in reinforced concrete structures continues to be a problem. The solution has never focused in eliminating the source of the problem, rather delaying it by protecting the steel, resulting in continued increased annual costs, in this case for the entire US infrastructure, especially in coastal communities. When looking at the cost in the state of Florida, with over 6,500 bridges under FDOT's management, of which a third is found in aggressive marine service conditions, and 54 deficient bridges, extending the surface life of structures beyond 75 years is a critical step towards a built resilient infrastructure. So the past three decades, reinforced concrete with non-corrosive fiber reinforced polymer or FRP bars has proven to be a resilient construction material. FRP bars are made through protrusion using continuous fibers embedded in a polymeric resin. The key benefits of FRP bars that result in a resilient concrete infrastructure is not only due to its corrosion resistance, but also the high strength to weight ratio and ease of application due to the relative light weight and handling. Some of the key mechanical properties are presented in this slide. It is important to highlight that the linear elastic behavior to failure, which is well understood, translates into adequate design guidelines. More importantly, when it comes to resilient materials, durability is critical, as we aim to extend to 100 years or even double the service life of our concrete infrastructure. To this end, the durability of FRP bars has been proven in several studies as summarized in this slide. Now let's look at the first project and discuss how FRPs are transforming today's resilient infrastructure. The Innovation Bridge or I-Bridge is a pedestrian bridge built here at the University of Miami Gables campus. The I-Bridge is a relatively simple structure using precast double T's with a 70 foot span, but in many ways is a first of its kind. On the top of this slide, you can see the cross section showing the cast in place pile caps, side blocks, PC double T's, and cast in place deck topping. While the bottom, you can see the place double T's and the cables to connect the monitoring devices. As I mentioned, the bridge is a first due to the use of basalt FRP bars, the use of auger cast piles as well as the first using unique and effective FRP reinforcing shapes. One of the innovative aspects was the use of basalt FRP woven mesh and filament winded piles delivered pre-assembled to the site, increasing the quality control of the reinforcement products and reducing construction costs. From a construction point of view, the project exceeded the owner's needs and expectations, having generated an optimized design structure that complies with facilities requirements and creates future maintenance savings. From an experimental point of view, 
the know-how was validated by conducting two load tests on girders as seen in this slide. Notice the dotted line represents the analytical model versus the solid lines showing the experimental results. Additionally, two load tests on the entire structure in service conditions was conducted. This is a very important step as it validates the structural performance to sustain hurricane and flooding loads. Ultimately, the iBridge remains a living laboratory, as on the one hand, continuous strain and deflection monitoring is going on, and on the other, it contributes to educational goals where students practice measuring parameters related to different aspects of civil and structural engineering. Steve Nolan with FDOT will now continue with this presentation. Steve, go ahead. Thank you, Francisco. So I'm going to continue with the slide presentation and talk about two different projects. The first one here is the IDOC, which is which was recently reconstructed after it was damaged from a hurricane event. As you can see there, looking at the sunrise, the dawn of a new day, and perhaps a new construction system. The, the IDOC was really a, a form of accelerated bridge construction, if you like, on a scaled down model. And so that was the interest of the Florida Department of Transportation, and we helped um, or my help personally with some of the ideas for the precast elements and, and the connections. So that was uh, part of the interest there. The demonstration project utilized GFRP, glass and, and BFRP basalt reinforcing, as well as some other FRP elements for the gratings, seawater in, in the concrete. So traditional construction Geometry was was maintained uh, in this case using the same footprint as the existing dock, um, using slightly battered piles to accommodate the pocket connections in the precast cap, um, and then just the connections between the simple span units, the precast elements was made on site with grouted or, or concrete joints. Here we see the precast elements being fabricated at the local precast facility with the cap on the left hand side and the block outs you can see with the plywood forms on the underside. The middle photo is the reinforced concrete pile, not pre-stressed, that was successfully driven on site. And then overall view of inside the precast facility. The schematic shows some of the block outs that are utilized for injecting the grout or inserting the reinforcing to make the elements composite. And then the completed precast elements outside of the, the yard with the secrete logo on the left there indicating that the elements were made with seawater concrete and improved sustainability. Construction was pretty typical um, of these types of structures <clears throat> using traditional pile driving equipment, barge access being available on the site was utilized, and the erection of the precast elements uh, went pretty seamlessly. So as far as the connections on site, in this slide here, we see the GFRP dowels or bent bars coming out of the void in the precast pile, and then the longitudinal darker bars are the basalt bars in the top, and basalt FRP mesh for shrinkage and temperature crack control. Um, since th these materials all have similar elastic moduli, and it, it's not much of a problem to mix and match the, the reinforcing elements. The photo on the left shows an open joint uh, before casting of, of the concrete to make it composite. And then center slide, you can see the channels down the middle of the precast beams holding the reinforcing uh, before the concrete's cast. Quality control was conducted on the concrete and the FRP elements during construction. Uh, everything came up as expected. And some of the conclusions from this are that the FRP 
helped reduce the size of the precast elements due to minimizing the cover and avoided the use of additives and sealants in the concrete. The lightweight of the FRP elements assisted in fabrication, both handling by personnel and equipment. And then ex the expectations for service life are extended and re reduction in maintenance costs as well. And then finally, the use of seawater concrete improved the sustainability. The last project we'll talk about is A1A um, along Flagler Beach. This was about one mile of shore protection for or highway protection uh, at the back of the sand dune. You can see fairly busy during a vacation period down there at Flagler Beach. And so this is a key element for the community for both tourism and for hurricane evacuation and and accessibility after an event. So it was important to keep this facility open during and after an extreme uh, weather occurrence. There was well over a million feet of GFRP rebar required in this structure, which is a technically an auger cast pile system. Assembly of the cages was uh, conducted on site. And you can see there with the cage being supported on stands with just a two by four. It's uh, very light compared to traditional reinforcing. There were some odd configurations at the ends of the piles using a tapered tip to facilitate <coughs> embedment to the 36 foot depth. And then the installation is unique in that it requires a guide wall to be cast to help align the, the auger cast piles as they are drilled into the sand foundation. Some of the cages being seen here delivered to the construction site and the augering process with the grout injection, cement grout injection occurring and then the cage is then dropped down into the to the filled hole. After the concrete is set up and the guide wall is removed, the GFRP reinforced cage is inserted over the top to make the entire system uh, longitudinally continuous and forms a set in concrete cast. These caps are below grade and so um, sand is buried, sand is covered over the top and the sand dune build up to restore it back to its uh, almost natural condition. These walls are then capable of supporting the highway uh, in, the, in the event of a major hurricane, again, coming in and washing out the beach and not being contingent on sand replenishment to ensure that the structure or the highway remains stable. So there are some outcomes from this project that are listed on the screen there. Uh, the biggest thing being uh, rapid installation and lower labor efforts required. And then ultimately these all can lead to more sustainability. So with that, I'd like to conclude and I think we've got some questions coming up next. Uh, just some acknowledgements to FOD for DOT for funding the last project and then the Center for Integration of Composites and Infrastructure, and the National Science Foundation for their funding and support on the other two projects. So with that, thank you. Hi, this resource training guide developed by Resiliency Puerto Rico and Enterprise Community Partners considers Caribbean risk areas with emphasis on construction for hurricanes and earthquake zones. My name is Daniel Stavak, visiting lecturer at the University of Illinois and the Rhode Island School of Design and collaborator of Resiliency. The content development team is with me today and will be uh, walking you through the guide. We want to thank Lori Schumann for her role as an advisor. Hello, my name is Danielle D'Angel. I'm a principal at Perkins and Will and co-founder of Resiliency Puerto Rico 
which actually formed right after Hurricanes Irma and Maria. And we are a global alliance providing resilient design and planning to communities uh, of every scale. Uh, we have placed the link here so you can visit our website and learn more about our projects. Hello, and I am Pedro Cifre, a structural engineer. I'm a senior principal at SGH and a collaborator of Resiliency. For the content development, we relied on our research and field experience, as well as the three key resources shown here. We will be walking you through the contents of the educational resources that we put together composed of five parts. While, while we use the Puerto Rico as our focus, the hazards presented here are the same for most of the Caribbean and the South Florida regions. Winds of 74 miles per hour or above can greatly impact the lateral force resistance of a structure. Maria pictured here reached a category five but made landfall in Yabucoa as a category four with 155 mile per hour winds. The Puerto Rico Building Code of 2018 sets the wind load value for the eastern uh, part of Puerto Rico at 170 miles per hour and at 160 miles per hour for most, most of the north, south, and central areas. This means that special care must be taken in construction. And although aftershocks are not something that happens with the hurricanes in 2017, we did see how Category 5 Irma was followed by Maria within 10 days. Here are some examples of the types of hurricane damage and all too common seen in the last few years, you can see from uh, blown rocks all the way to storm surge. Then uh, in January 2020, earthquakes of magnitude 5.8 5 and 6.4 occur in the southern part of the island. It was really a reawakening uh, for residents and, and scholars to present and understand the real risks of earthquake in Puerto Rico, which have not been experienced at these magnitudes for some generations and from which not much has been studied. During an earthquake, you can experience shaking and consequently sometimes landslides or even tsunamis. Liquefaction is another possible uh, consequence in which ground becomes unstable and ruptures causing sinkholes and damage to infrastructure. Particularly in the Caribbean, there is poor oversight for code compliance and a large percentage of houses are built informally, making them extremely vulnerable. Here we see weak structural connections, improper concrete mixtures, rebar corrosion, poor timber anchorage, lack of soil retention or wrongly located houses, among other things. There are three key components to safe construction, beginning with site evaluation, like what are the soil conditions and the hazards imposed by the surrounding context. Structural continuity, are there bearing walls or columns without support? And load path redundancy and continuity. In other words, are you able to clearly trace how the load will transfer through the structure all the way to its foundations? Given these risks and factors, we wanted to use the guide to also make homeowners aware that there are construction professionals, each playing a critical role as part of a team working in unison to design a safe house. And there are many professionals and organizations seeking to help those in need. And so, our mission is to bring awareness across all audiences in order to build community knowledge and prevent the tragedy that is the loss of shelter. 
This way, we believe we can empower homeowners through all phases of the construction process. Part one uh, of the guide covers practical advice of uh, what to do uh, before, during, and after an earthquake. Part two acknowledges professional organizations uniquely positioned to help during an emergency. For example, in Puerto Rico, the AIA and Voluntariado de Ingenieros, a nonprofit formed right after the earthquakes, have played a critical short-term short role in safety assessment. Right after the storm uh, or earthquake uh, event, tagging of houses is really important. A red, yellow, green placard signifying safety conditions is critical to inform homeowners whether they can re-enter their house uh, because it's safe or if it's not safe. Safety assessment program training for architects and engineers is available, and we highly recommend it for those wishing to get involved in disaster relief. Now, part three of the guide was developed by engineer Eddie Guerra, a co-founder of uh, Voluntariado de Ingenieros, and offers field observations of the most common earthquake failures and recommendations to repair them which he uh, saw uh, boots on the ground in Puerto Rico. Part four of the guide uh, then focuses on the combination of construction typologies and processes using wood or concrete, which are uh, most common in Puerto Rico and across the Caribbean. We followed a logical construction sequence, uh, beginning with an understanding of common concrete footing failures and tips on proper ways to design with rebar. The general recommendation is that footings for all typologies are made of concrete. We touched on reinforced concrete construction, its pros and the detailing challenges that require experienced labor. We move to the reinforced masonry systems or concrete block construction and the common mistakes that are made in the field causing some of the crumbling wall, wall failures previously shown. We talked about wood construction, which is often perceived as weak, but actually it is especially resistant to earthquakes and can overcome hurricanes if it is properly built. The material selection as well as the redundancy of fasteners are important for this typology. We concluded part five with general notes for hurricane construction. Uh, for example, hip roofs uh, generally perform better. Short awnings are less susceptible to uplift. Uh, separating secondary roofs protect the main roof from uplift. And you must have a continuous load path. Uh, from roof to foundation, such that the structure can behave as one. We want to close this presentation by offering a case study project called Techos, in which Pedro and I worked on, and it is how we met. Uh, it was a design build workshop supported by MIT. After Hurricane Maria hit, my colleagues, Luisel Sayas, Jorge Silen, and I, uh, were struck with a sense of urgency to help with the widespread damage. Our platform was architecture. Here are the six structures that we built for underserved families in different parts of Puerto Rico. We built three in 2018, four months after the hurricane, and three in 2019. And these are the smiles of the families living under each one of those roofs that Maria took and that for multiple reasons, we're not able to receive the necessary aid until this project. And thus we're living on substandard conditions. Doña Maria, Doña Leonor, who passed away last year, Joana, Carmen, Teresa, and Jesus. We organized and funded this project overseas through a network of institutions that believed in this cause and supported us with funding or knowledge and they are shown here. In the meantime, 
we flew back and forth and met with community leaders, with our incredible contractor, Gabby, and with the families that we believed we could help. This is one of the preparation meetings we had with Pedro on the structural design and challenges of the houses we had found. One of my students, Cristina, prepared the diagrams uh, from on-site measurements. After many months of preparation, we were finally on site with a team of students and Gabby's crew of carpenters. You can see Pedro in action, explaining details to the students. And there I am with Gabby discussing construction sequence and details on day one. We would meet after construction sessions to learn and discuss the effects of hurricane winds with Pedro. We worked very hard for a week with the best and most responsible team of builders and students, some of them veterans from the first reconstruction workshop. They really do deserve a lot of credit for the patience and their passion. And this is me checking with Gabby, the contractor, how to install a detail designed by Pedro. And this image sums up our relationship since we started making these projects. One of friendship, respect, and gratefulness. These interior process images show some of the redesigned beam and support details. This design was revised and compiled at the end of the workshop into design and construction guidelines that contributed to the comprehensive guide that we presented to you today. To fulfill our mission of not only building for ourselves, but also helping others build their knowledge and capacity. These are final images of the work. and one of many meals that we shared on site from local businesses that supported our work. And we even got some treats from Carmen, one of the homeowners. You can only imagine the feeling of relief and accomplishment that we felt as we wrapped up our last roof. These are the smiles of 2018 in Villalba, Puerto Rico. And the smiles of 2019 in San Juan. The proof of concept, of course, we all went up on the roof for a group photo. There is a lot to be done to continue empowering homeowners and connecting professionals with those who are in most desperate need but hopefully this project will inspire many today to learn more and support ongoing reconstruction efforts like ours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you from all of us, the audience. So now is the time for Q and A. I've been monitoring uh, the Zoom section on questions and uh, I do not see any so far. So let me start uh, uh, myself with uh, a couple of questions going in order. And the first one would be for Dr. Trussoni. Very interesting project. And I think the question for you would be from a permitting standpoint, what did you have to go through in order to make sure that the resilience concept that you wanted to implement were also approved by the regulatory bodies. I'll give you an example. Uh, the solar panels, did you have to do something in particular to ensure that they can stand where they are meant to be during a wind storm? Yeah, sure, thank you for your question. Uh, like with the solar panels, there's a subcontractor and there's a subset of drawings that need to be submitted uh, in order for those to be approved. And so for a lot of different aspects of the project, uh, 
they have those kind of sub drawings that you have to put in by the subcontractor. They're called sub permits. And so when you go, when, when I go in to get a permit or when you typically go in to get a permit, you're going to get what's called a master permit. That master permit is going to cover the whole construction. But then when you get into different areas of the construction that might be uh, more intimate or have more specialty engineering that would have a, a separate engineer that would go in and, and design and engineer those. Sometimes the, if the rebar gets very complicated, they'll have uh, shop drawings for the rebar, sometimes for railings and other types of uh, engineering systems within the building. You'll create a, do a separate set of drawings with a separate set of engineering. Those will get submitted to the building department. Those will also get reviewed by the building department and then those will get uh, approved and then installed. So for the solar panels, to answer your question directly, um, those had a whole complicated mounting system that goes with them. It was a little less complicated because we had a concrete roof and so they could go right into the concrete. If you're dealing with a wood roof, then those, mount, those uh, mounts have to actually land on each one of the trusses and so when you submit that set of sub drawings, those would go in and be approved, you know, based that they're going to hit each one of those trusses. Ours was a simple expansion bolt with, a, with an angle. Um, uh, and then it had a stand that goes up from there. And then they sat about 18 inches above the, above the roof. Another aspect about having equipment on the roof or solar panels on the roof uh, is that uh, typically you don't want to see those from the street. There's actually some zoning ordinances that... Uh, require you to block those from view, especially the mechanical units, because they don't, they don't want people from the street to see big bulky equipment uh, up on the top of the roof of commercial or even residential structures. And so you have to provide some sort of screening uh, in front of those. And, you know, we did masonry walls up there to screen the mechanical equipment. Um, but, you know, those are some other little intricate things about some of the details that go into the sustainable aspects of the construction. Quick follow up. So you found that the, um public officials in charge of the approval of the permits were uh, very understanding and open to uh, proposed modifications? Yeah, I mean, I think they are. They have, they have a set of rules that they got to go by, right? I mean, it's the, the ordinances and the Florida Building Code is the law. So, I mean, they have, they have to follow the law and they go through their procedure to make sure that they do. But they were more accommodating when, you know, different aspects would come up, like, the insulation is another one. Uh, the spray on insulation, they, at first they were a little uh, taken back by using that, even though, you know, some other types of spray insulation are used uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of different houses. But uh, this was kind of a newer type of insulation that, uh, that we were proposing to, to use. And so we had to submit some, some extra spec sheets to show that the R value was what we were claiming it was. Because uh, it, for that particular insulation, it has a very high R value per inch. And so we were only showing four inches and we were saying that it was an R30 uh, insulation when they were used to seeing something that's more like seven or eight inches for an R30 insulation. Wonderful. I'll follow up with questions related to, uh, let's say, regulatory agency and code with the presenters of the fourth uh, uh, talk today. But let me jump to Dr. Garemanine Zad now, who made the presentation on very fundamental research. And the question for him is, uh, aside from the excitement to see that uh, concrete may become almost like a human being where we eat vitamins, now we will give protein to, to concrete. The, the question is really, how far do you think is the implementation of this technology in real, in real meaning in, in construction uh, today, is there an opportunity to uh, deploy some of this innovation that could represent really a quantum leap in terms of the durability and, and resilience of uh, concrete structures? Okay, thank you, Dr. Nani, for, uh, for the interesting question. For some reason, uh, you cannot see me, but that's okay, at least I can talk. Uh, so that's a very uh, interesting question. Uh, let me say this. We are not the first to propose using proteins or these biomolecules in concrete. Romans, two, 3,000 years ago, they used it. They didn't know that they were using it. Maybe they used blood. As we all know, blood has a lot of proteins. Yeah. And where the blood came from, I don't know. Let's not go there. 
they used uh, milk, uh, they used curdled milk, and they used sugar. And at the time, they realized that these organic or these natural materials were able to influence the properties of some construction materials. They didn't understand the fundamental mechanism, that's okay, uh, but they were first to start this, so the credits go to them. Now, in terms of implementation, I would think that uh, we are making, we and other groups are making uh, significant progress towards the implementation of this. Uh, obviously, from the talk, one can see that I'm more on the fundamental side of the research. Uh, however, I foresee this being probably implemented in phases in 10 years or so. Some big chemical companies, uh, BASF, uh, is seriously looking into this. And they're also, I'm aware that they're also doing some R&D on some aspect of this, uh, of this uh, type of approach. Uh, so I, I think maybe uh, it's not gonna be in the next few years, but hopefully in the next uh, decade, we will see the, uh, the implementation of this. Thank you very much, Ali, for this uh, interesting, uh, both presentation and response. And then going back to the Romans, sometimes we joke about the fact that the gladiators were truly, uh, they had a true complete life cycle uh, from cradle to grave because some of the blood that you mentioned might have come from them. On presentation number three, I'm going to skip for a moment, Dr. DeCaus and go directly to uh, Mr. Nolan. Uh, and it's a general question, and I kind of want to put you on the spot a little bit. There is a transportation bill that is coming up, and there might be significant funding for the rehabilitation of uh, the national infrastructure. How, what do you think is the take of Florida DOT, if you may, and obviously speculate, in terms of making this infrastructure more resilient. So I think in my mind, let me qualify the question. There is a need for more mobility, but there is also a need for resiliency. And the two sides of the coin may not you know, provide the same type of solution. Can you speculate on the interest of the department in addressing the resilience uh, in addition, obviously, to the mobility? Yeah, um, obviously a, a very complex question and even more complex answer. But So the department's obviously, well, you may not know, but they've, they've put a significant focus into re resiliency in more recent years. Now, resiliency means different things to different people, obviously, and Often as engineers, we're focusing on robustness perhaps more than resiliency. Um, but it, let's say the majority of the work has been done at the planning stage and identifying where the, so the, the weak points are in the system. Um, I think we're a long way from projecting <laughs> where they might be in the future. Um, there's, there's, there's a gradual awakening, I would say, um, some of that is obviously politically influenced and, and some of it's just <laughs> old and new engineers stuck in their ways, but um, there's definitely a renewed national interest in, I guess, funding more infrastructure development. Where that money goes is going to be influenced a lot by who's um, shouting the loudest, perhaps, um, but there certainly is it certainly is a discussion going on where it's going to end up. I couldn't really tell you. Um, and the department isn't necessarily on the bleeding edge of it from a, let's say a sustainability standpoint, but from a protection of the asset that there's, there's great interest in that and how you, how you achieve that is, is there are different philosophies on, on doing that. And, and often it comes down to money, you know, you spend 
you spend more money, you, you get more, but that means you can, can't build as much elsewhere. And so it's trying to balance that value you get for increased investment versus what you're leaving behind. And, and even the scope of what we should be considering beyond just highways for trucks and, and cars into more pedestrian mm -hmm. and other mobility aspects is also um, a, a broadening focus, let's say, of the Department of Transportation. So spreading resources even further than perhaps they were before, higher expectations on what our infrastructure should meet as far as uh, the, the service life uh, replacement times in the past, we started out with timber, you know, and you could re replace something every 20, maybe 30 years. And then we went to reinforce concrete and pre-stressed concrete. And we thought we'd get 50, but maybe not in Miami. Um, <laughs> and so now we're looking at 75 and 100. And um, we, as you know, we've just did a workshop in New York for a 200 year bridge. And what, what would that even mean? I mean, um, so yeah, lots of questions. Um, we, we're building new bridges every day though. So they, these incremental changes are, are creeping their way into, I think, the practice, um, but it's still, yeah, it's still a bit of a, a uh, well, <laughs> we'll see. We're yeah, <laughs> putting absolutely. our thumb on the scale as much as we can. All right, wonderful. Thanks so much, Steve. Uh, Francisco, a very quick question for you. Uh, just almost a, uh, another situation, because of the operation that you uh, run at the University of Miami, and I'm referring to the Structural and Materials Lab, you deal a lot with industry, with uh, um, innovators, but also traditional companies. What do you think is in their mind with respect to resilience? Is this something that they think about when they look at... Uh, products that uh, they propose to the lab for testing? Or is this like uh, uh, one of the things that we talk about to be quotation mark politically correct? Uh, it's a great question. And very briefly, I think uh, it really depends on the owner, meaning who are they trying to service? I think uh, uh, Matt will probably also agree. And obviously he was the owner for his project, so he knows what he wants. So contractors typically will follow whatever the owner wants. And I think you have two problems with the owner. One is sometimes they don't know what they want, right? So how does a contractor address the unknown? And they will try to fulfill that unknown correctly or incorrectly. And then the other type of owner is the owner that exactly knows what they want. And maybe they want resiliency. Maybe they want cost savings. Maybe they want both. Uh, so meeting those demands uh, ends up being pushed to the contractor, which typically might need to either follow the, whatever they've been prescribed or come up with solutions. Mm -hmm. I think some contractors are looking to sort of add value to, to their services by finding you know, what works well with them and how they can Absolutely. basically save their own money so they can pass it on to the owner. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, you don't mind, question. I could follow up on that a little bit. Absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and thanks for that. I agree with that perspective 100%, uh, Francisco. I, the thing that I wanted to add on was you're starting to see other people emerge in the marketplace. Uh, I have a couple of clients right now, a, a, an owner who's first doing a project for themselves, uh, and they want a highly sustainable building and resilient building. Uh, for part of that reason, they are going to be implementing uh, the FRP rebar in the project. Uh, they're also looking at doing you know, solar panels and creating a net zero home. We're actually in, in permitting on that project in, in Broward County. Um, and another client who is a developer, this one is probably the most interesting for that question. And they're actually looking to make a market for themselves on building and developing and selling sustainable homes and sea level rise resistant homes. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, you're seeing that happen in the marketplace. It's starting to change. I think some savvy developers, I would call them, are starting to see that there is a demand you know, maybe almost analogous to what happened in the car market with Tesla, right? Like Tesla kind of went after a lot of high-end clients right away with their first prototypes. Uh, and with the intention of over time, you know, having that technology reach a, reach a level of scale, uh, economy of scale that the price can come down and then it can eventually be open for everybody. But I think in the, you know, in the real estate market and, you know, in the general market and with institutions, I mean, we see it right here at the University of Miami, 
when we build buildings at the University of Miami, we build them very highly sustainable, you know, net zero, LEED certified, you know, all those types of things. So you're starting to see the savvy owners and the savvy developers, you know, start to pick up on these sustainability and resiliency trends and see the value in them, right? Because I mean, really it's about looking and finding the value in those sustainable things. When, when you go to put solar panels on a, on a building, we want it to be sustainable. We also don't want it to be highly uneconomic. So as long as the economics are making somewhat sense uh, and, it's, and you're also getting what you want uh, as far as a performance and as far as a building or an infrastructure project, I think you're gonna start to see that trend accelerate uh, here in the future. Wonderful. My question now goes to the fourth group and actually is both for uh, Daniele and Pedro. You will decide who wants to jump in or both of you. And is more related to the scaling up of your operation. So obviously very exciting project. You made the difference for a couple of families. You engaged the students, but other components that could make the picture bigger are obviously the government and uh, uh, the, the, the implementation of code. So how do you think that your work can be conducive to a scaling up of the experience that you lived through in, in the last couple of years? Pedro, do you mind if I take a stab at it? Absolutely, go ahead. Um, that is a great question. Uh, uh, Tony, that is the question. Um, we think of these projects perhaps as, as diving in, uh, getting our, our hands dirty, connecting with the situation, understanding the problem. Uh, but the hope, the real hope is to do a lot more, make a lot of impact. There's still blue tarps in Puerto Rico yeah. that we haven't been able to fix. And you are very right on the fact that government would make a big difference to partner up with these kinds of uh, operations, which would not get anywhere without the help, even if it's not funding, because that is a whole other issue. Even if it's not about funding, about facilitating, infrastructural uh, facilitating makes a big difference. Um, storage, mobilization of material, um, collaboration and coordination, and, and even streamlining the amount of, of, of construction that can happen. So um, having a government partnership, even for these kinds of assets, I think are, are a huge uh, game changer for scalability. If we were gonna build 35 homes uh, at once, of course we would rethink the methodology mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the kinds of materials and, and the potential for prefabricating a lot of those, but if we have buy-in from uh, logistic, logistically from an institution that would make the whole difference. Pedro. Pedro, I need uh, think to add. Yes, uh, one important aspect of this, uh, and this is an excellent question. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Is one of the aspects of this is uh, involves uh, the formalities of permitting, uh, construction permitting, insurance, and professional liability. In the projects that we saw, they, it so happens that uh, the, the cost of the work was such that the local municipalities do not, uh, do not uh, require a permit for that type of, uh, it's, you can even call it a repair. Uh, and we could argue forever of, you know, when is a repair a repair, when is an upgrade an upgrade, a modeling, new construction, et cetera, right? But you, you can start seeing the, the, the boundaries that start coming up when you start going to another level of formality. Um, it happens that uh, these uh, projects involved informal construction, which is a great proportion of uh, the residential uh, housing stock in, in the island. And uh, as such, it, they, it, it ironically allows for an informal approach that is not so easily uh, implemented in another uh, scenario. So we were dealing with that bad situation generated by informal construction 
and then being able to take advantage of some of the informality surrounding those circumstances to be able to move expeditiously uh, and, and in, a, in a very responsible uh, and thorough way. But uh, it is, uh, uh, it would be a lot different if this were done in a framework where of, of more formal construction in which yes. you would have an insurance company with a clipboard person there, FEMA, bureaucrats, paperwork everywhere. Uh, the and, agent uh, from the bank for the loan and things it, 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 Exactly. So we were uh, we were remedying a bad situation with you know with um, the best approach, uh, but it, this is not something that is easily scalable uh, for all these other regulatory and and, uh, and liability aspects. Because the other thing I want to mention is that uh, there's no good Samaritan law in Puerto Rico, right? And in most uh, most uh, yeah. Most jurisdictions, most uh, jurisdictions. So uh, once you once you get away from the scale, you start bumping into a, a lot of these abstract uh, constraints. In addition to the um, monetary and resource constraints that uh, Daniele was uh, referring to. Excellent. Really, the takeaway for me is really informal cities also require informal solutions. You, you know, we cannot just use a only one way approach. I have a question uh, finally, and I wanna pose it. And then after that, maybe I'll let you go. Is- uh, um, We actually have one, a question uh, in the chat. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm reading. Uh, okay. And it's really for Dr. Trussoni. And the question is kudos to you for new construction, but picking up on what Pedro kind of hinted to, what is the potential approach for retrofitting current construction. Again, recognizing that the reality in Puerto Rico or in informal cities is totally different from, let's say in Miami, Coral Gables or Coconut Grove where you operated. But let's remain in a, let's say, US type of environment. What are the opportunities for retrofitting uh, existing, you know, let's say residential uh, dwellings to become more resilient like you have demonstrated? Sure, uh, thanks, that's a great question. I don't know who posed it, but we do appreciate the questions. Um, so I think the lowest hanging fruit uh, is probably gonna be insulation values, right? Uh, if you're dealing with a typical, a lot of the typical Miami construction, uh, that you're probably 1940s, 1950s, 1960s type house, uh, it's probably got, uh, 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 rafters uh, that were built in place. Uh, so your insulation is on the underside. You could uh, do an isonine spray on insulation up in the attic, right? That's gonna keep that heat away from the inside of the house. Uh, that'd, that'd do a lot for uh, improving your envelope uh, performance. Um, new windows and doors, if you're doing that with new glazing, you wanna make sure to get that uh, low, T, low E type of coating on your, on your windows, on your glass. Uh, that's going to help reflect a lot of that heat away from the house, even if you don't have overhangs that can, that can cover uh, those windows and doors. Um, structurally, without new construction, it, it's going to be a little difficult. Um, I do know in certain instances where people have gone in and uh, cut open the ceiling uh, and the roof and retroactively applied some tie-down anchors, um, I think Daniele had talked about the wood construction, uh, the connections and the importance of the redundancy and the wood construction. And so that's very important for those types of roof is to make sure that those tie downs are in place. And so if you're worried about, you know, the roof, you know, your roof structure, you could have a contractor or structural engineer come in and take a look and make sure that those tie downs to the masonry construction, the masonry walls, because that's typically what it was, uh, that the wood rafters are tied down to those masonry walls. Um, that's probably the best you're going to do with the retrofitting for the for the structural and with the windows, getting the impact windows with the with the low E glass, um, uh, and the insulation values uh, would be good. On the mechanical side of things, water heaters. Uh, if you switch from your traditional tank type of water heater that kind of keeps the water warm all the time with an electrical resistance uh, heater, that usually wastes a lot of energy. So if you go to a, an Insta Hot or a tankless type of water heater or the type of water heater that I showed in my presentation, which is a, a heat pump, 
I didn't get a lot of time to talk about the heat pump water heater, but the heat pump water heater is very efficient uh, because basically what it does is it takes the heat out of the air, right? So it takes the humidity and the heat out of the air and it puts it into the water. And then the byproduct of that is air conditioning. So you're actually taking the heat out of the air, putting it into the water, and then you're adding extra air conditioning to the inside of your house. So that reduces the demand on your air conditioning system, right? Um, and so those are one of those, you know, aggregated benefits that, that we really look for when we're designing for sustainability. Um, and then, and of course, you're not going to do that just out of the blue if, unless your water heater is, you know, getting old and you need to replace it. But if you need to replace it, you know, that's a good idea for replacement. And then also with the mechanical systems, uh, most of the older mechanical systems were probably like an efficiency factor. They call it a sear factor of 12 or 13. Uh, now, if you're replacing it, you probably want to replace it with a mechanical system that's in at least an efficiency of 17 or 18. Um, you know, it might cost you a little bit more money, but you could go to like a two stage, what they call a two stage or a variable speed. And all that does is it allows the mechanical system to adjust to the amount of heating that you need, you know, by varying the fan speed. So it's not using all of the energy that it needs right away, um, uh, so to speak. Um, and so that's going to allow you to, uh, you know, reduce, you know, your demand. So when you're looking at it, it's always the basic, you know, you want to reduce the demand, you want to increase the efficiency uh, of the equipment and things on the inside. So, I, you know, those are a few tips that people can use. Wonderful. This, the time has come for me to thank all of you, the presenters, for uh, really a lively uh, uh, webinar that I think provided very interesting uh, responses and solution to the existing problems that we have from residential dwellings all the way to our transportation from formal to informal construction. Obviously, I thank the audience, even if I don't see anybody other than seeing names and uh, Laura for making all the arrangements in the background uh, for being a great producer. So with this, I again, thank you. I wish you uh, a good rest of the day and obviously a great uh, uh, continuation of this uh, um, event. And uh, I'll leave you to the next uh, session that is gonna start I believe at uh, the bottom of the hour. Yeah. Thanks everybody and uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks everybody, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you everyone.